from the only Jesus we have is the risen Christ. He is risen, and he is with us. He promised that. All days until the end of the world, he is with us right now. Let's just go through this wonderful gospel. The, the two disciples recounted what had taken place on the way. And the early Jewish Christian movement was called the way. The way. And these two disciples, these are the two who were walking from Jerusalem to the village of Emmaus, seven miles away. And you remember what happened. They were so despondent because of Good Friday that they had their heads down uh, in dismay. And the risen Christ began to walk with them. And he broke open the Scriptures for them. He, I wish I could have heard what he said. He... he explained the Scriptures to them. And then they invited him to stay. He was late, stay with us. And they went in and they recognized him when he broke the bread. Now from Emmaus, from what happened with the risen Christ, we get the structure of the Eucharist, the structure of the Mass. The first part, which we're in right now, is the liturgy of the Word. The Scriptures, huh? the proclamation of the Scriptures. And when they are proclaimed, it is the risen Christ who is speaking to us. The Word of the Lord. And that's why it's so wonderful to be a lector, because you're being used as an instrument through which the risen Christ speaks. So there, there's the first part. And then they went in and they recognized Him in the breaking of the bread, how He blessed the bread. And we have the liturgy of the Eucharist, the two main parts of the Mass, where I make my retreat at Spencer at St. Joseph's Abbey. They have two votive lamps. They have one votive lamp at the tabernacle for the Word made flesh. But they have another votive lamp right here for the written Word proclaimed. He is present in both ways, the liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the Eucharist. The, the risen Christ. Uh, they didn't recognize him. And we found that to be the case with Mary Magdalene and the other apostles as well. Um, there's a reason for that. Because Jesus was transformed uh, with a glorified, risen body. St. Paul says a spiritual body. Uh, look at it this way. Uh, so he's the same, but he has changed. Have you ever uh, met someone uh, with whom you went to grammar school, maybe in the sixth grade, the last time you saw them, and it's 40 years later, and, and you're going to meet them, and when, when you first see them, they've changed. We don't change, but, but they change. And, and, but, and once they identify themselves, you can see. You actually can see what they look like uh, in the sixth grade. You can actually see if this is the same person, but they've matured. They, they, they're, they're older now. See? It's something like that. When once they realized it was the risen Christ, they could, they could recognize him. They could see it. But at first, uh, they, they, they weren't sure. Now, the same risen Christ... Uh, after Emmaus now, he goes back to the upper room where these two disciples returned and speaks to the other disciples with them, Shalom, peace be with you. Once again, no anger, no revenge, no resentment, none of those negative, but just may God bless you in every possible way. This is what the risen Christ is like. And they thought they were seeing a ghost. I don't know if any of you have seen a ghost. You can tell me after Mass if you have. Right. They, but they, they thought, because he, he's got this transformed, risen, spiritual body, uh, and yet he does have a body. It's not just, it's not just a, a spirit floating around like a ghost. He does have a body. And... Uh, he, he shows them 
his hands. He shows them his feet. He shows them his wounds. And this is so important that he still has his wounds. The five wounds, the hands, the feet, and the side. And I, I encourage you to come up and look at this altar after Mass. There are five crosses representing the five wounds of the crucified and now risen Christ. And what that tells us is that even in his resurrected, glorified body, he, he has his wounds, but now they're glorious wounds, and that suffering had a purpose. There was a reason for it that it somehow purified the world of sin. We're going to have a risen body. Do you understand that? That, that after this body dies, uh, when we share in the resurrection, we are going to have a body. When we say the creed, we believe in the resurrection of the body. So you're going to have a body. And as his wounds, are still there, so our wounds of life, our suffering, have not been wasted. But they too will be part of our glorified, risen body. I've already put my order in ahead of time. The next time I want one at least six foot tall. <laughs> You're going to get a new body, a glorified, risen body, just like, just like the, 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 the risen Christ. Uh, he shows them his hands and his feet. He eats some fish just to show that, that he has flesh and bones and, and, and that he does have a, a real body. Uh, and then he says to them, touch me. Go ahead and touch me. You want to touch the risen Christ? Would you like to do that? You can do it. Every single time you come up to receive the Holy Eucharist, it is the risen Christ. The Holy Eucharist is the risen Christ. It is the bread of life, the living bread, not dead. The living bread come down from heaven. When you receive the Eucharist, you receive the risen Christ, and you touch him in your hand or on your tongue. And something even beyond that happens. The life of the risen Christ, once you receive communion, flows into you. You are literally united to the risen Christ and are being fed and being nourished from him. Just like a baby in the womb is fed from its mother, so you are being fed by the life of the, uh, of the risen Christ. You can touch him any time you come to the Eucharist or any other sacrament. He's present in them all. Then he again explains the scriptures. I wish, I wish I knew what he said. He explained the, the law of Moses and the prophets and even the Psalms that we sing, 150 Psalms. He explained them to his first disciples. And then he closes by saying that mercy, repentance for the forgiveness of sin is to be preached and proclaimed in his name beginning at Jerusalem. It's to be preached to all the nations, folks. The entire world. And I've told you this before, but finally, the Catholic Church, which means universal, finally, after 2,000 years, we're almost universal. We're all over the world, on every continent. Huh? We're almost universal. Uh, and and that's, that's what he commanded. But it is mercy to be preached, forgiveness of sin is to be preached, repentance is to be preached, and that mercy is abundantly available if we want it, if we ask for it, if we repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. Fill me with your mercy. That's what it's all about. He is still here, and he is still forgiving, and he is still saving, uh, and he is still nourishing us. The risen Christ. It's his very life we share right now. So heaven and earth are definitely connected.